nestled throughout Britain, there are extraordinary garden sanctuaries, where nature provides harmonious spaces to relax, unwind, and reflect. It is extraordinary. I mean, out of the spring, this, this great thing has just evolved. They're places where we can appreciate the beauty, form, and bounty of the natural world. Just amazing. The rhythms of the season root us to the land. We are in the midst of Eden, picking apples. Walk around any garden, and you will instantly sense that it is all about hope and expectation. So, unsurprisingly, gardens have always been thought of as spiritual places, spaces that nourish our hearts and souls. My work as a garden designer, that's what I'm after, mini paradises. After all, as the poet says, one's nearer to God's heart in a garden than anywhere else on earth. And I think we often forget how key the garden is to the Easter story. So to celebrate this year, we're going to be visiting some of our most spectacular heavenly gardens. It's Good Friday, a solemn day of reflection and contemplation. And so today, we'll visit a garden with religion at its very heart. And this garden, where beauty has blossomed alongside scientific discovery. I'm here in Cambridge, a place where I once studied as a choral scholar. Now, the great passion tied music means that Easter is a very special time for singers, so it somehow feels appropriate to be back here, visiting a garden that, even in the darkest days of winter, sends out a message of hope and renewal. And Arit explores a magnificent house at the centre of our biggest religious revolution. I'll be uncovering the secrets of one of England's most exceptional Tudor gardens. But we start in a garden which looks back to the time when British gardening really began, in places which created little Edens in the wilderness. In the north of Scotland, Pluskerton Abbey stands in a peaceful wooded valley east of Inverness. It's a Benedictine monastery founded in 1230 as a place for monks to lead a life of prayer and reflection. And of course, gardens were an essential component Indeed, the inclusion of heavenly gardens within the enclosed monastic community was there right from the beginnings of the Benedictine story. I mean, look at that. And there are still monks living here, and there is a garden. I'm going to go over there and see what, if anything, has changed in its eight centuries of existence. Today, the abbey is home to 18 monks, whose daily life is structured according to a Catholic religious manual called the Rule of St. Benedict, named after the monk who wrote it. The complex is surrounded by greenery, including this ornamental garden. Resplendent in its autumn colors and with paving laid out in the shape of a cross, it seems like the perfect place to begin our Good Friday. I'm meeting Brother Michael to find out what role gardens play in the monastic life. So what are the central principles of a Benedictine way of life then? Um, 
I suppose the most um, noticeable thing for outsiders is a timetable. So every minute of the day has really got something assigned to it. Uh, so if I were to think of your 24 hours as a, as a pie chart, how do the allocations work out? It probably won't add up to 24. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, let's say uh, there's about four to five hours uh, prayer in church. There's maybe another two hours of, of private prayer and, and reading. There's about five hours uh, manual work, you mm. know, other activities. And I think if you were really sharp, you, you could get eight hours sleep uh, mm. if, you, if you got your head on the pillow straight after a night prayers. I'm not sure. What, does that add up? I think that, well, it's <laughs> a pretty good idea. And here you are surrounded by these beautiful ancient gardens. And I suppose so the, the garden features again and again throughout the Christian story, doesn't oh, it? Oh, very much so, yes. I mean, the, the story of Good Friday even in, incorporates it. Jesus was taken from the garden at the start by main force. He surrenders himself. He dies, and then he's brought back and laid in the garden at the end. So how important is the garden to the monastic life? The garden is meant to be a creation in which God and mankind are in uh, harmony, a reflection of how things ought to be. Mm. It's uh, the sort of realization of God's plan, if you like, everything right. That's a lovely idea. So the equilibrium of, of the right balance yes. of power, yeah, yeah. the kind of Eden then. Yes, yeah. Yes, I mean, uh, the, the Garden of Eden is, is the model, if you like, yes. Yeah. The rule of St. Benedict on which the order is based, states that there should be a garden included in the enclosed religious community. And Pluscadon Abbey faithfully follows this ideal, including this tranquil cloister garth, or garden, right in the heart of the monastic complex. It's usually a space reserved for the brothers, but I've been given special permission to visit it. You see, even in the depths of autumn, this cloister garden still has that wonderful sense of being an Eden, shut off from the world, that I think old St. Benedict was after. It's easy to feel the benefit of a serene, contemplative space like this. But to find out why gardens have been central to the Benedictine community right from the start, Arit's gone to London to unearth an old diagram that might just hold the answer. <laughs> Look at that. I know. It's quite amazing. <laughs> this is one of the areas where some of the rarest of the facsimiles, etc. I've come to the Senate House Library, a collection of over two million books, to meet Professor Michelle Brown. She's pulled out an illustration that sets out the ideal layout for a Benedictine monastery, which includes many of the same features Alexander's found in Scotland. It predates Pluscadon by over 400 years, but clearly demonstrates the same principles of weaving Christianity into every part of the design. So, this incredible thing is the ground plan of the Abbey of St. Gall, and this could be the master blueprint of how a Benedictine monastery should look. And at the very heart of the map, mm -hmm. next to the church itself, is the cloister. So it also echoes the Garden of Eden with the four rivers of life mm. coming out of it, which you also find yeah. not only in Christian, but also in Islamic yes, yes, that's, and garden yeah. design as well. Oh, and here you can see you've got the main church yes. and you've got a little medicinal herb garden. And then you've got an orchard where the monks would be buried in amongst oh, the fruit trees. How the ultimate piece. Yes. Um, and then you've got the vegetables yep. growing in these beds. And you notice something else, that all of the rest of the herbs and fruits, etc., they're all at the East End looking towards the Holy Land. And I think, again, this is celebrating the fact that the you're giving praise and worship for the fruits of creation as well. I mean, when you see it laid out like this, yeah. again, it, it absolutely represents that phrase, isn't mm -hmm. it? You are closer to God when you're in a garden. garden. And the monk who founded this monastery had written the most wonderful thing. He said, nature 
is the second scripture in which we perceive oh. God. I love that. I love that. Just like the plan of St Gall, at Pluskerdon Abbey, gardens surround the church, including an orchard. When their time comes, the monks aren't buried here, but graduate to the cemetery in a secluded area of the garden, shaded by trees. It's a reflective space, that's got me thinking about what's involved in this life of devotion. I've been to a lot of religious buildings during my time as a chorister, but I've never been inside a working monastery. So to get a better insight, I've been invited to join the brothers in the part of the abbey called the choir. This is just one of eight daily services that collectively make up what's known as the work of God. These chants are designed so that the whole course of the day is made holy by the praise of God, with thanks given for the new day. And for me, it really is a moving experience. Well, that was a great privilege to be asked to be part of the choir for that service. And for the first time ever, I just got a glimpse of what the existence here must be like. And it's so substantial. You know, the focus on prayer the focus on devotion, focus on work. Started to get a sense of what it must be like to live in this community for the rest of your life. But of course, besides worship, the brothers also need to tend to the grounds. So throughout the day, they aim to strike a balance between aura, meaning prayer, and labora, meaning work, as set down by St. Benedict in the sixth century. I mean, your, your fruits all look so fantastic. Produce grown in the gardens helps to feed the community throughout the year. And here they grow that most symbolic and divine crop, the apple. With over 120 varieties, harvesting the forbidden fruit is a major undertaking. So I volunteered to reunite with Brother Michael in the orchard. I have to say, Brother Michael, here we are, in the midst of Eden, picking apples. This feels very appropriate. <laughs> What's the history of this orchard? Most of the trees here were, were planted by ourselves. I, I grafted a lot of them. Did you? Uh, we, uh, we got lots of varieties via a twig through the post. Uh, uh, gra grafted onto root stocks, yeah. and then the following season it, it grows up into a, into a tree of, the, of that variety. And how many summers before they're producing fruit of their own? Um, well, you're supposed to stop them fruiting for the first couple of years so, right, that, the, 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 so that the tree puts its energy into uh, uh, putting out roots and yeah. uh, establishing its strength. So that's sort of five or six years, then you can start picking them. This one is a, a brilliant keeper. Uh, so we, we're picking it now, uh, but we won't think of eating it for about another three months yet. Um, it, it kind of ripens in store. That's clever uh, of it. It, it is, yes. It, it, it's, it's rock hard now. You wouldn't, isn't it? You no, wouldn't you enjoy wouldn't. eating it. That's a, that's a russet, isn't it? What's it that? is. It's, it's a uh, bel de boscoop. Bel de boscoop. Yes. Very good. We must, we have, we've been chatting away. We must <laughs> pick these up. Yes. It feels entirely right, doesn't it, that the maintenance and harvesting of this beautiful orchard should be part of the work-prayer balance here at the monastery. But isn't it amazing to think that a detailed manual written 15 centuries ago can still configure lives today? Oh, 
The Benedictine view of a heavenly garden doesn't seem to have changed here since St. Benedict first described it. But moving from the Middle Ages to the Tudor period, that idea underwent a dramatic transformation. Across the country, gardens transformed from religious havens to playgrounds for kings, representing their mastery of the environment and their rightful position in the natural order. Perhaps religion was draining from our gardens, as it did in the Good Friday story. Aritz been visiting a magnificent house in Gloucestershire to discover more. I've come to the Cotswolds to visit Sudley Castle near Winchcombe. The castle was once a magnificent royal Tudor house, and it's this period that's left a lasting impression, even on the garden. Today, I've come to see Lady Ashcombe, who's the current owner and has been overseeing these gardens for the last 50 years. Throughout the grounds, there's a wonderful connection between the garden and the history of the house. And nowhere is this more evident than in the Knot Garden, a typical Tudor garden design that displays order and symmetry. Lady Ashcombe, it's actually stunning here and amazing to think that 200 years there was quite literally just ruins and then you're one of the families that have come back and restored it and how does that feel? Well, I didn't come back immediately to, uh, 150 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> no. But um, it has been a, a progression of the family, mm -hmm. the Denton Brocklehurst family, um, in a 150 years of restoration. Yes. And, and trying to bring the castle back alive to what it was in its Tudor time. I mean, it is yeah. absolutely stunning. And, and how does it feel for you personally to live in a place like this? Well, it's a really interesting challenge because mm -hmm. um, I opened it to the public, yeah. and we've got all those amazing historical characters, everybody you've ever heard of. Mm -hmm. Some people say, say, ask me, is it haunted? <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's haunted in a very interesting way, yes. because you can fi sort of feel the, the history. Yes. It's evocative. And then, do I to take sure. a seat? <clears throat> and, I mean, look at this. Splendid. So yeah. tell me about the Knot Garden. Well, the Knot Garden I put in about 20 years ago, I guess, mm -hmm. and it was to celebrate Queen Elizabeth's the first very regal progressions that ended up at Sudley on three occasions, but uh -huh. one particular occasion. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And we've taken the, the pattern of the, the knot from um, the dress in the Tudor succession, which is a, 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 a painting in our collection. Yes. shows Henry VIII with Elizabeth standing to the right in her magnificent gold pattern dress. It's a very symbolic painting and the garden it's inspired also has underlying meanings as well as a rather surprising origin. And of course the knot it's a mystical uh, symbol of something very beautiful but you can't solve it because you could never undo it, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to contemplate on that you know, concept. But uh, it's one of my favorite places in the garden now. The water feature, though, has that Islamic type of influence. And, and why did you bring that into the garden? This sort of patterned knot is a very Moorish Islamic style uh -huh. um, that was in Europe, but it was really came to England in Elizabethan times and it, it, the um, gardens always had a water feature yeah. because it's to do with the senses. There's the scent of the garden, mm -hmm. there's the look of the garden, um, and then there's the water that's representative of, you know, uh, the spirit of the garden. 
Oh, it certainly works. Yeah. And also, look at the setting. You know, you've got what you've done in more recent times, and it's backdropped against that fantastic room, and it's such a wonderful blend. It is kind of amazing, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I tend to, in a way, get you very used to it, but when I look at it with fresh eyes, it's pretty nice sitting here and looking at it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love this imprint on the ground. It reminds me of a mandala, the sacred Sanskrit symbol, and perhaps for that reason, I find it a wonderfully tranquil space. And that sense continues throughout the 14 acres that make up these extraordinary gardens. They're absolutely stunning and have been for centuries. This wonderful garden is a pleasure garden designed to delight the senses throughout the year. And so it was in Tudor times. But in those days, it sat in a wider, sacred landscape. To discover more about how we interpreted our relationship between the natural world and God in ancient times, Alexander's just 40 miles away in the county town of Herefordshire. This is the ancient college garden at Hereford Cathedral, and I've come here to Hereford to track down one of the greatest treasures of the Middle Ages, the largest medieval world map anywhere. The exquisite work of art known as the Mappa Mundi sets out key biblical tales, including the Garden of Eden and the Good Friday story, and shows how they fitted into our view of the world. I'm meeting archivist Elizabeth Semper O'Keefe to examine a copy of the original. It's wonderful to have a chance to look really up close at the map. Um, can you orientate me? So it wasn't intended as a map in the way that we think of a map, where we want to understand places in relation to each other to be able to work out how to get somewhere, how it's going to take us. This is really an illustration of a whole load of knowledge of that period shown in one layout. Yes. So you've got biblical knowledge, but you've also got mythological things. You've got the golden fleece over here. I wondered here. what that was. That was beautiful. But the biggest biblical story is really the story that Christ appears in judgment over the world. The map is shown right. as God's creation held within the circle and that Christ is in judgment over it. I see. That makes sense because they've obviously tried to cram all kinds of things in here and they're not too fussed what the relationship is. That's right. So there's some areas where the places appear very much in relation to each other correctly. Right. That could be because it's on a very familiar trade route or a pilgrimage route, so they know town after town after town appears. Other areas, Africa, a little bit vaguer. Yeah, vague. But they're trying to show the world as understood at the time in a theological context. So it's showing Jerusalem at the centre, and it's literally mm -hmm. in the centre of the map with the crucifixion shown above it. And then you've got the Garden of Eden or Paradise, which is shown here as a, a separate island surrounded by flames. So it's actually preventing humans from getting back there. Here's Adam and Eve having been cast out and an yeah. angel with a sword preventing anyone from returning. But above all that, in the kind of top position, is Christ shown in glory. So that's a fairly major axis, isn't it, then? So you have Christ coming down Eden, Jerusalem. What have we got down here? Well, so we're down into Europe, into Europe, and Hereford itself is mm -hmm. shown just here, very faded, where lots of fingers over lots of years have gone, there's Oh, that's Hereford. us, yeah. <laughs> oh, you can see that's where we live. Mm. I suppose now that we're fascinated, our, our place in the world is something we're interested in from a purely geographical, navigational point of view. I suppose at the time, your place in the world, you only really needed to know what your spiritual That's right, so you, your place in the world was in relation to God. Yes. It's a breathtaking artefact, full of humour and colour. And it's quite astonishing how central, literally, the Good Friday story was to this view of the world. Of course, our 21st century maps now focus on where we are geographically, 
rather than our religious position in the world. And this shift to a more secular way of thinking may have something to do with a massive religious transformation that all began here at Sudley Castle and these heavenly gardens. It was whilst here with Anne Boleyn that King Henry VIII decided that he was going to abolish all of England's monasteries. It was the beginning of the end for over 800 religious houses and their bountiful gardens across the country. Just five years after his visit to Sudley, many of England's monasteries were no longer places of contemplation, but ruins, victims of Henry's dissolution of the monasteries in 1536. For many, Good Friday was changed forever. And you don't have to go far from the castle to see firsthand the destruction caused by Henry's monumental decision, as Alexander's been discovering. To understand just how significant this revolution was for our religious houses and gardens, I've come to Hales Abbey, just two miles from Sudley. This was one of the most important pilgrimage sites in Tudor England. But the colossal monastery and gardens that once stood here are now only ruins. I'm meeting local historian Carol Harris. Carol, how do you do? I'm nice Alexander. to meet you. Lovely to meet you. And here we are, meeting right in the crossing. Yes. And so here would have been the choir. And that would have been the high altar where that long mound is. I see. And then behind that would have been the shrine. You can see how enormous it must have been by the size of the pillars that were here. The monk's entrance would have been through that door there. Into the cloister. Into the cloister. Well, shall we go and have a look? Before the dissolution, the abbey drew pilgrims from far and wide to visit a sacred relic from the crucifixion itself. Some drops of Christ's blood shared on the cross on Good Friday. There's a story that Anne Boleyn visited Hales, mm -hmm. or at least sent advisors yeah. to visit Hales, uh, I think chiefly to investigate the, yeah. the relic of the Holy Blood. She was known to have an interest in the reformed religion, so it would have been in, in character for her to inevitably have heard about Hales, it's mm. very well known, and to be rather suspicious. I don't think she was the first person to have doubts no, about indeed. the authenticity of the Holy Relic. And you, you do get stories about it. Um, liquefying yes. or if you, you didn't see it it showed that you um, didn't have a clear conscience that's oh, very clear <laughs> that's a cunning way yes so of course you had an extra um, incentive to see it to make sure you did yes, yes. and or then eventually when when the abbey was dissolved it was taken up to London and destroyed and the dissolution came about how and what was the process of that well, they came on, I think, to both abbeys on Christmas, uh, Christmas night, 1539, because they were the larger ones. Yeah. Uh, they Christmas weren't... seemed a harsh time to be coming, didn't it? it? It seems a terrible time to do it and turn, virtually turn people out. And they'd take all the treasure, presumably they all took the, the treasure. gold and silver. And there were things like taken. bells, which yes. were worth a lot yeah. of money, and the gold and the silver. Does the abbey have any religious role these days? No, sadly, it doesn't. We used to do the Stations of the Cross and the story of Good Friday here. On Good Friday itself? On Good Friday. I think it's very important that these monuments are still connected yes. to the communities they serve yes. and to their, their historic role. Yes. W whatever the reasons, people had an enormous amount of faith in building and maintaining yes, somewhere yes. like this, of endowing it, of looking after it. And say, so even though it's no longer in use as a religious building, I think that the memories of the people who came for so long are still here. Yes, I think as a focus for so much belief, as yes. you were saying before, yes. that is its significance. Yes. I can't think of a better setting to reflect the solemn and contemplative mood of Good Friday. As a chorister, I've become accustomed to religious buildings, but this place has made a lasting impression.
I've also had lots of ruins in my life. And for some reason, I'm finding Hales Abbey profoundly moving. I think it's because it's so well preserved. And I think because the proportions of this whole monastic foundation here are marked out so clearly. And as somebody who's spent a good part of my life processing in and out of similar monastic buildings, it doesn't take much imagination just to see the whole structure soaring up. And for that reason, I find myself bitterly missing it. I just wish it was still here. It's clearly so beautiful. It's tragic that monasteries and gardens like Hales were lost forever because of a decision taken here at Sudley. Perhaps Good Friday is a good time to think philosophically about new life coming after death and destruction. And there's no better place to do that than in Sudley's magnificent Queen's Garden. It's named for all the monarchs who've been through these stunning grounds from Anne Boleyn to Elizabeth I. It's beautifully planted with over 80 varieties of roses, which I've come to help prepare for spring with head gardener Stephen Turoad. Now, before I kind of get cracking into here, let's decide what it is that your aim is today and then we can have a chat while I'm helping you. Fine, well, by pruning, roses we're encouraging all the time young growth to be produced mm -hmm. um, thereby we have better flowering but also it keeps the plant young because we're removing the older wood which would otherwise just build up within the rose marvelous um, so what we're doing today is we're going through taking out any little dead pieces like, such as this yeah that, that would be removed down to where it joins the stem usually a sloping cut mm -hmm going away from the bud yeah. and that makes it a perfect cut there and, and you tend not to get the dye back and of course the other thing yes. is there is a saying in gardening that growth follows the knife ah oh. and okay. uh, so you <laughs> so, some, sometimes if you're pruning you can think oh I'm taking too much off but remember yeah go on particularly in the winter yes the harder you cut the more it grows okay on Good Friday, cutting back to encourage fresh growth is filled with symbolism. And it's made me reflect on all the gardeners that have tended these grounds over the centuries. So I'm working here with you, but really, I mean, how old do you think this garden dates back to? Well, this particular part of the garden is probably Tudor. Um, the garden, as we see it today, mm -hmm. was created um, in the middle of the 19th century mm -hmm. by Emma Dent and Emma Dent took the footprint of that 16th century garden yes. and laid out the present one um, as a typical Victorian parterre with a whole mixture of plants in yes. it um, but this has been a garden ever since so we are literally standing on um, that footprint on that footprint and following in the footprints of much earlier gardens Stephen, what are you hoping that people are going to experience when they come to the garden? Well, I, I think Sudley has the potential to um, inspire people in, in many different ways. Mm -hmm. um, so, being a garden, um, it, the beauty and the peace and tranquility of it can be inspirational. Yeah. But also, of course, Sudley has this fantastic history. We have people like Anne Boleyn and Queen Catherine Parr. Um, Queen Elizabeth I, right. all passing through here. So that alone can inspire an interest in, in the history of the country as well as the history of the garden and the property. Yeah. So there are a whole bunch of things. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't agree more. Personally, I love the feminine feel of these gardens. Perhaps that's a reflection on the strong women who've shaped the castle's character and destiny throughout its history. The gardens at Sudley are quite remarkable. 
they look back to the past and bring forward peace and beauty as inspiration. But we need to look to the future and gardens can do that. Zander's gone back to college to find out how. On the banks of the River Cam is the beautiful city of Cambridge, where I once went to university. And in the south of the city is this delightful patch of greenery. This is the university's botanic garden. Essentially, it's an outdoor laboratory, and it's all about innovation and looking forward. I've come to take a walk with the director, Professor Beverly Glover, to find out more. Hi. Beverly, how Hello. do you do? Nice, Very to, nice meet you. to meet you. This is so lovely to see. I'd love to come in from the old end. Extending for 40 acres, the garden contains over 8,000 plant species. But they're not here just to look pretty. Since its creation in the 19th century, the garden here has had a very clear purpose. What was the, the, the guiding principle behind the garden? So we were founded by John Stevens Henslow, who was professor of botany in the university at the time, and he really wanted a botanic garden where he could work on plants in their own right. He wanted to understand how plants worked and how, what you could learn about the fundamentals of biology from them, but in a beautiful setting as well. And he persuaded the university that he needed a garden much bigger than the little physic gardens that were traditional at the time, where he could really study plants in their own right. I'm trying to think, what, so what was specifically scientific about the planting here then, that so made that easier? One example, for instance, is that our trees are arranged in family groups all around the, the perimeter of the garden. I so see. you go from the chestnuts into the limes, you go from the magnolias into the walnuts. So you can look at how plants are related to one another, members of the same family, even if they don't look the same. You can look at what the traits are that have put them into these family groupings. Because you don't get a sense of... of, of, of everything being clustered together and looking no. terribly uniform. No. It's all, it seems perfectly aesthetically correct, the way it's laid out. <laughs> well, that's where we're at our best, where we can yeah. bring together the brilliant horticulture yeah. with the fantastic science behind it. But the science here has been inspirational. I mean, Henslow is most known for having taught Charles Darwin when he was a student here in Cambridge. Darwin learned all his botany from Henslow, and it was Henslow who was asked to nominate the naturalist to go on the voyage of the Beagle, and he nominated, see, nominated his student. Darwin. And it's just amazing looking at these trees and thinking about the yeah. conversations they had about variation and species and how that led into what Darwin went on to do. So how revolutionary was this as an approach to gardening? Well, the really revolutionary thing was Henslow's belief that plants were worth studying in their own right, that yes. they weren't just useful as medicines for people, but that they had a lot to teach us about the fundamentals of biology, about how life worked, and that they needed to be studied for their own sake. That was what was really amazing, and to bring the plants together here in order to be able to do that, to support the research and teaching, was the really big change that he made. This is a radical departure from what went before. In the early days of science, gardens were planted bringing together plants that have similar uses, in particular for medicine, as Aritz been discovering. Before Darwin and his contemporaries revolutionized the study of plants, flowers were still valued for much more than just ornamental pleasure. They were physic for the soul and the body. Physic gardens were once common throughout the British Isles, used to cure everything from chest phlegm to spiritual possession. In the nearby market town of Dunstable is this wonderful example where I've come to lend a hand to volunteers Mary and Sarah. It's divided up into seven different beds, okay. all with plants that um, are specific to different complaints. Oh. and whether they worked or not to. <laughs> well. But many of them have been proved to be absolutely correct. Well, the thing is, is that, you know, modern medicine relies on plants. Absolutely. So it, it, it does make sense. If you've got coughs mm. and colds here, yeah. headaches and restorative tonics, chamomile, it's best known always, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. And this is St John's wort, and that has always been used for depressive and yeah. that sort of thing. 
as much as I talk about <laughs> obviously all the plants and how they help our elements, it would be unfair of me not to give somebody some help. So what do we right. doing? To, what's my first job for the day? Well, this is the bladder, kidneys and diuretic sort of plants here. <laughs> is that wise? I'm so far away from the loo, Mary. <laughs> is that really sh you're sure about that? OK. Right, all right. Uh. <laughs> Thankfully today, we're just putting in violas and planting some lovage, not administering these herbs. How does it feel for you ladies to be able to come down here and uh, work on this garden? It's really lovely and everything has a lovely aromatic smell and we all feel better for it. Yes, I guess yeah. it's also there's that connection to thinking this has been done for millennia. Well, of course, the Priory was here from 1123. Yeah. And, um, but I mean, even then, most of those plants have been used medicinally for, you know, come back to the Greeks and the Romans. Yeah. And that's the so, thing, isn't it? You know, that the fact that these plants have stood the test of time. Absolutely. Okay. All these dog roses growing all along the fence. The hips of those are vitamin C. Yeah. And I mean, like, do you remember having, always having to have rose hips? syrup. Did you? When we, yeah, when we was little, you know. Did you really? Yeah. Well, we certainly yeah, did. We I did. mean, I'm old enough to have gone picking them in the war, but <laughs> when there wasn't any, you know, there wasn't oranges available, yeah. so we had to do that. Just carry on and exactly, yes. take, take what you could. So why have we got lovage in this bed then? Well, it is good for your kidneys and mm. internal organs, and it's used a lot in Europe as the flavouring in soups and stews. This yeah. actually came from Sarah's Dutch neighbour. How nice that he shared the, uh, shared the yeah. love, quite literally. <laughs> <laughs> it was the monks that thought about plants of having both spiritual and practical properties. And that's why they would have arranged visit gardens like this, all by functionality, how the plants can help the function of our coughs, our ailments. But to take our understanding of plants into the future, at the University Botanic Garden, they're grouped together for scientific study. Beverly has brought me to some beautiful planted beds, aimed at encouraging new life and learning the bee borders. They're really all about um, showing our visitors how to grow plants that will support pollinator populations, but also again about the science and the beauty combined. And we do the research to figure out why it is that bees are in visiting those flowers. So what are the factors, do you think? So it's things like uh, a reward. So yes. bees like flowers that provide lots of nectar, maybe yeah. particularly sweet nectar or a particularly high volume there of it. There are degrees of nectar. Yeah, okay. better nectar, more nectar. Is there anything visual that bees that gives them a sign that the nectar might be sweeter if it's brighter or...? No, there's no direct link, but bees are attracted by particular colours and patterns, by scents, of course, if yeah. they smell nice. Um, and there are flowers here that we're interested in because we don't understand what the factors are. Bees are found in many sacred books, from the Bible to ancient Sanskrit texts. And in the Quran, Honey is described as one of the four rivers in the Garden of Paradise. Today, we're interested in finding out why bees like a little yellow flower that for many of us signals the start of spring. This here is Narcissus tete, -tete. It's a, a commonly yes. grown commercial um, variety. And we've noticed that the bees quite like it. They're not normally yes. very keen on daffodils, but they seem to quite like this one. So we want to take it and have a look to find out why. I've got a hunch what it's doing that's making it attractive to bees, but we're going to look at it under the microscope and see if I'm right. I mean, it's very attractive. It's very beautiful pretty. thing, but uh, it doesn't, no discernible scent. No, it doesn't have no. a strong scent. Um, it's got a little bit of nectar, so there's some food in there for them, but that's true of most daffodils. So what, do you th what do you think it is then? Well, I think it might actually be something to do with how easy it is for the bees to hang on to. Wonderful. Clutching our flowers, we're heading to the Sainsbury Laboratory a groundbreaking research facility within the garden. To work out why bees like our daffodils, we're going to use an electron microscope that can magnify up to 100,000 times. But first, we have to prepare our sample. So, um, so to start with, we put some of this glue onto the stub here, the holder that we're going to put the sample on. 
we only need a tiny snippet of one of the petals, which is stuck to a block to hold it in place for the scanning. So that's all ready, and then we can take it across for the next stage. To make sure the flower cells are preserved in their living state, the sample is placed in a holder and snap frozen in liquid nitrogen slush. It's about minus 210 degrees centigrade in there, okay. so it freezes very cold, very quickly, right. uh, and means that essentially all of that living tissue is fixed in place exactly as it was when we picked it. Good. That's the idea. The sample is then placed precisely in the microscope. Okay. Yeah, it's good. Thank you. Now we now turn on the electron beam and seeing what it looks like. So, so that is the leaf. That is the the petal. This is the bit you yeah, cut out. That's the part of the petal I cut out earlier. Now let's have a look at close in. So each one of these things here, yes. that's a cell, an individual cell. You can see from the scale bar, they're about 20 or 30 micrometers across, so about a 50th of a millimeter. Okay. Um, but I think I can see from looking at them yeah. a little bit of the answer to my question. So if we look more closely, um, they are sort of pyramid-shaped, cone-shaped. They're not smooth and flat. Oh, no, they're not. And they've also got all these little wrinkles on the surface. Yes. Yeah. Um, and all of that will mean to the claws of a bee, there's stuff to lock into, like on a climbing wall. Whereas a smooth, flat surface is quite difficult to work yeah. with. Yeah. You see, this is, <laughs> this is the thing. This is the first time I'm sort of understanding the idea of a flower as a kind of, as a sort of sentient thing. Yep. Do you know what I mean? Because yep. I, we don't, you know, us non-botanists just take a flower, grows, one, there it is. Well done. Well, they have to solve all the same problems that an animal has to solve. They have to get enough to eat, stay warm enough, dry enough find a mate, reproduce, set their offspring off in life, but they have to do all that rooted to the spot. And so they have all of these clever biochemical solutions. They can make compounds, they can make themselves attractive to bees so that they can achieve the same thing. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, it really is. And when you look at plants and let them tell you themselves what they're doing, then they're so fantastic. <laughs> Isn't nature amazing? This scientific process has given me a whole new philosophical perspective on the plant kingdom. Of course, there have been times in the past when scientific revelations like this have caused serious religious conflict. Arit's been finding out more in that other great city of knowledge. come to Oxford Botanic Gardens to learn about a gardener who would change forever the way people would think about plants and his name Thomas Fairchild. Thomas was something of an experimental gardener and his test produced a plant that shook the religious community to its core. Professor Stephen Harris is the curator of Britain's oldest collection of dried plants and incredibly, this collection contains one of Fairchild's specimens. Tell me about this gardener who clearly seems to have rocked the world a bit. So, um, as you say, Thomas Fairchild was a, was a gardener. He, uh, he ran a, um, a nursery in Hoxton. Mm -hmm. And probably the most famous thing that he did was to um, produce the first artificially created hybrid that's been, that was documented. And this happened in 1717. Mm -hmm. So what we have is a sweet William mm -hmm. and we have a carnation. Yeah. And Fairchild took the pollen of the, of the sweet William. He, uh, placed it onto the stigmas of the carnation. Yeah. Um, the seed that was produced, he then grew up and it produced this, which is Fairchild's mule. And it's called mule because it is a, it is sterile. Wow. So let me just take that all in. <laughs> because looking at plant material from that time is amazing. But also, I guess, it was really revolutionary. Yes, there's two things that are going on mm -hmm. at this time. There's this idea that species are fixed, they're God-given, and they don't change. Okay. But Fairchild was able to show that if you take this and this, mm -hmm. or, um, you can produce something that is different. It's clearly not God-given, yeah. um, and so somehow you can, you can mess around, if yeah. you like, with creation. 
Wow. And how did that impact as well? It was revolutionary, uh, potentially, from a, um, from a garden's point of view, because suddenly there was, this, there, was, there was a new way of generating variation, yeah. and therefore potentially a new way of uh, getting commercial income. And it was also revolutionary from the point of view of how people thought about the nature of plants, particularly in terms of um, these um, religious associations that came yeah. with, uh, with plants. And I think that's something that is absolutely astounding because to be transported back 350 years knowing that this was going to reshape how plants and people and theology and science all merge kind of is a little bit mind-blowing to be honest. It seems apt on Good Friday to reflect on how our understanding of the world and the plants within it has shifted from a theological to a scientific perspective. But that's not to say that looking scientifically means we have to lose sight of how gardens can make us feel. Alexander's found a good example of how the two can sit side by side. At the heart of the Easter story is the promise that even in the worst of times, there is hope. And no matter where they are, every garden has the potential to convey this message through the natural cycle of the year. I'm heading to the Winter Garden with Head of Horticulture, Sally Pettit, to find out how. So, Sally, tell me about the, the, the Winter Garden here. It was established 41 years ago, really with the purpose of actually showing the great range of plants that you can have to bring interest to your garden in winter. Yes. So it's a real kind of ex good exemplar of, of you know, what anybody can almost bring to their garden in the, the winter season. It's a pleasant surprise to find such a wonderful array of colours and textures leaping out at you as you enter the garden. And what have you got to play with in a winter garden? A um, great range of things. So some of the key things are, are coloured stems, flower and scent, which we've got here with this Daphne Blue, a Jacqueline Postel. And there's something so particularly overwhelming about winter scents, because they're so unexpected, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. You know, people come in and they're really assaulted by this wall of scent yeah. as they come into the winter garden, and it really does pick you up on the bleakest of winter days. Doesn't it? Just. Uh, so what else? Show me. Show me what else you've got along here. Well, we've got lots of colour, so you can see the stems here and the leaves, so lovely contrasts of interest and shape and texture, so that you just get this great blend of forms, really, that just give immediate wow. Look at this. I mean, there's so many different... And the textures here, look. These yeah, so you, you get this lovely soft, um, you know, greyish bloom against this lovely New Zealand um, grass. Wonderful. What about over here? So in the background, we've got one of the Tibetan cherries, which has got this beautiful red, again, smooth stem that's very, very tactile. Um, and beneath it, this great mass of intertwined bramble. So it, it, yeah, you just get these very, very different textures. And the, the, the bamboo, look how well the low light picks out that sort of yellowy light on the colour on the bamboo stems there. I mean, yeah. it really couldn't show itself better. Yeah, and we, the garden has been designed for that reason, so that you actually take advantage of that low winter sunlight and it picks up all those colours on the stems as well. And whoever would have thought there was this much variety of texture, colour, flower, all in the depths of winter? Yeah, it, it really is amazing that we've got probably a couple of hundred plants here to bring, you know, interest and zing to the garden in winter. And yeah, plenty more to see as we wander through. Even with my limited horticultural knowledge, I can appreciate the arrangement of this garden. It's beautiful. But I also get a sense that there's a deeper intention underlying it all. It feels like there's a sort of narrative to the garden's design. Is that that's a yeah, deliberate? Yeah, Defo was very, very deliberate when it was designed. So we wanted to show the great diversity of plants for winter, but also to set them off in a very, very aesthetic, pleasing way. And is there a, is there a particular mood you're trying to evoke 
with it? Um, definitely, I think. We're really, really trying to show that a garden can be an uplifting place in the bleakest of winter days. So we, we hope that it does bring joy to our visitors. And there, of course, is a lovely Easter message there, right in the, in the depths of, uh, of the bleakest mm -hmm. months, this wonderful message of, of new growth. Yeah, absolutely. It's something that we hope is really very uplifting and joyous. For many of us, Good Friday is a solemn day, a day for contemplation and reflection. But it's also the beginning of a new, transformed world. In a way, that's been the story of the gardens on our journey from the tranquil Cloister Garth at Pluscadden Abbey, to the ordered pleasure gardens so loved by the Tudors at Sewdley Castle. And finally, to Cambridge, and a garden designed to instill joy and wonder nestled amongst the scientific planting. Throughout, we've seen how gardens can be places that provide a sanctuary, that reflect our history and give succor to the soul and hope for the future. Arit, hi. Isn't this just a stunning garden? It is amazing. All this colour and texture. It just feels like spring is coming through. Absolutely. In this program, we've explored how gardens can reflect the sombre mood of Good Friday, but also convey an intoxicating sense of new life. Next time, we're going to be looking at gardens that illustrate the message of Easter, hope, joy and resurrection. And so, Francis, it's time to say goodbye and to look forward to Easter Sunday. Goodbye, goodbye and happy, happy Easter. Easter. On Easter Sunday, we'll visit stunning heavenly gardens full of hope, wonder, and new life. And in these beautiful surroundings, there's just a tremendous sense of fulfillment. I'll be checking the health of ancient trees at a magnificent Scottish palace. Moment of truth, let's see how you're doing. And I'll be exploring a playful garden, <laughs> spreading joy in the community. Oh, I've been squeezing the lumps out. Ah!